Hello everyone, my name is Narain and in this session let's understand system design for distributed storage. For example, AWS S3 or Azure Blob Store. Distributed storage is a place in the cloud where you usually uh, create an account and add credit card information and then start uploading your files. The file size could be smaller or it could be huge, it doesn't really matter. When you keep on uploading these files into the system, the system scales automatically. And these systems are called as scalable system or elastic systems. You are going to pay only for uh, the amount of storage you have consumed or the number of times you have accessed that specific object or the file or the blob which you have uploaded into that system. And if you want to design a similar system, and how do we do that? In this system, let's understand exactly that. First, we have to define the goals of the system the goals are listed over here. The first goal is durability. For example, AWS S3 says that they give the durability of 99.9999, total 11 nines in the end, the percentage of durability. What does that mean is that most likely it's highly durable, that when you write a file into their system, most likely that you will never ever lose that file. It is always present in that system, so you can always access that back. But have you ever wondered how they actually tell you uh, that we give you 99.9999 and 11 nines of uh, durability? The way they calculate is using Markov chain algorithm. It's also called as reliability analysis using Markov chains. I'm not gonna talk about that, but you can read about it, it's interesting. The next thing is availability. So we want our system to be always available. So usually S3 says 99.99% of availability. So we want our system to be always high available. The third one is multi-tenancy. That means that you can create multiple accounts or many people can create multiple accounts and start uploading all of these files into the system. And we don't want our system to be separately deployed for each and every person or account. The same system will be available for every different customer and they should be able to view all their files in their respective console or something like that. And the one system will handle all the customers. That's kind of called as multi-tenancy. And also we want to support virtual hosting style access of the files or data. Uh, example, you can see on the screen that you can access your bucket on S3 using bucket.s3.aws.com, whatever, or you can always access the other way, s3.aws.com slash your bucket name and slash all the path to the files. So we have to provide that feature as well. And the third one is the system should be scalable. As I said, the customer shouldn't be worried about scaling the system or anything. The system should automatically scale so that the customers can keep on uploading how much ever files they want to. And the fifth one is region specific bucket. These kind of systems usually give the ability to create a bucket in specific region and start uploading your files and access the files back. And also give the ability to replicate these files into multiple different regions and start reading from there. But a couple of um, uh, systems also give you the ability of writing or updating the files from any region, but most likely these kind of uh, systems will not guarantee consistency of the files. And the sixth one is we have to give the secure uh, layer of access. That means that all of our API should be working on HTTPS and the content should be securely stored in our storage system. Now let's understand how to build this specific distributed storage system. Instead of jumping straight to the complex system design, let's start with bottom approach where we start from simple design and then keep scaling up to the complex design where it supports all of the uh, system design goals which we just discussed. The very simple design is having only one server having a couple of APIs exposed and we have a couple of TBs of storage in here. Say for example, if we can have about you know 20 TB of storage in this server, Consider we have 20 TB of hard disk and we have exposed a couple of APIs in here. One file to upload, read and list the files in the directory or whatever. If a person wants to uh, create uh, his bucket, all he has to do is call the API to create a bucket. It basically creates a folder inside your hard disk and then he can start uploading the files into that hard disk. So this works smoothly. The problem with this approach is these API can handle only so much of the traffic because there is always this I.O. limit and also the number of APIs which any single server can handle is also limited. And also uh, you can't keep uh, writing a lot of um, uh, files parallelly as well because the hard disk will choke. 
So this system is not really scalable. So the next version we can do is simply is why don't we just add. So in this next version of the system, we are scaling horizontally where we have two servers, both have 20 TB of capacity. And now we have APIs here as well. And now we have double the capacity of traffic handling and also the storage. Now in total, we have 40 TB of storage. But the problem with this is, so user has to decide which server he is writing into because obviously we'll be using some of the load balancing technique. Uh, when the request, uh, when the user makes the request to the load balancer, it is most likely that the request, sometimes the request might end up here and the sometimes the request might end up here. So in this case, if you use sticky session, maybe things might work, but it is not always reliable. What if your code is making a call to access this file? It is not always reliable because if you upload a file, the file upload might, the file might be created in this server, but when you're reading, the request is going here. And when you read from here, the file is missing. So this is not totally reliable approach at all. So what can we do to solve this problem is we have to separate the API part and the data storage part. So how do we do that? In this system, what I have done is I have separated out in the API server and the storage system totally. Now these API servers are commodity machine. We don't have hard disk um, over here. We might have hard disk, but it is very minimal. It is uh, most of a CPU and RAM intensive machine. So these are uh, dedicated to accept the input, incoming request of read and write and list the buckets or something like that. All the write operation will be handled by these servers. They are similar to the ones which we are using, but they are separated out. And we have one more layer called as metadata layer or metadata server. This could be one more service or server where it also has a database because we need to track what file is in which server or something like that. So what happens is when the file is uploaded, the upload API might go over here and here it doesn't matter. First, this API will actually talk to the metadata service and request for what is the server to which I should be writing the file. So in this service will create an entry for that specific file which we are trying to upload and mark it as this file is in server one or server two. So it tells this API server that, okay, you can go ahead and write in server, maybe server one. So what it does is it goes to um, the API. So it goes to this data storage server one and then writes this file over here and then gives back 200 or whatever respective uh, status code. And the next time when the same file file is read, and the next time when the same file is read, when the request comes in, maybe this request will not go to this server. Maybe this goes here. And this API server before it reads, what it does is it goes to this database or metadata service and ask for the location of that file. And this metadata service will give you the location as one because we had an entry here that this file was written into data store one. So we get to know where exactly that file present. And so we make a call to that respective uh, server that is one, and then we get back that file. So all working well. The problems with this system is, now what happens if this system goes down, right? So we will have to scale this as well. And what happens if this is this data storage system goes down as well? So we will have to keep on replicating that into a couple of servers. Now, how do we replicate it and who is going to replicate it? So there are so many questions over here. One way to do is maybe let's hand it, hand it over the replication responsibilities to this data storage server itself. So where this storage is going to replicate and who is going to take care when this replication goes down and all of these questions again. The one simple way to do is let this service itself manage that also. So this server is going to talk to these uh, two storage servers always and keep checking the health of this storage. And also it keeps uh, checking what is the storage availability over here. And then based on that idea, it is going to tell these API servers where you should write and what is the situation of these servers. Uh, maybe if this server is down, maybe then it will tell you that instead of going to one, go to one's replica or instead of going to two, one, two's replica. And also it takes care of the responsibility of replicating this copy over here uh, as well. Or maybe it instructs this data st uh, storage server itself to cop, you know, keep a copy of one more copy of the file, which is recently written into this file as this storage server as well. 
So that way the system is kind of working. If you see on a high level, what are the systems we have? So we have a separate API server, okay, over here. And we have a separate server, which basically takes care of the replication, the health of the storage uh, servers, and also it keeps track of where these files are and something like that. So this is the very high level system design for the distributed storage. Now, how can we scale? We can easily scale by keep on adding these servers. So as and when you add these servers and we, we have to update this metadata service that now you have these many servers and maybe you have more servers as a replication, okay? Um, and also you need to make sure that these servers are not in the same data center or region. So these should be placed in a different region. Maybe it's in the, uh, you know, Asia, uh, and these servers are maybe in Europe or US, something like that. So if this bucket was create, was meant to be created in Europe or US region, or just take one, say for example, if you wanted to just create in Europe region, that means that these are the primary servers which are in the Europe region, and uh, these are the secondary servers which are in Asia and they are replicated. Because why do we have to replicate in the different region is because if something happens to the data center which is in the Europe, then we will lose everything. So we have to keep replicating the data into some other region where it is safe. So that's the way. We shouldn't be just keeping two copies. Maybe we have to keep one more copy in that case, let's keep one more replication server for every server. And then we keep copying all of this data asynchronously to all of these servers. And maybe this one is in Australia or somewhere. So we know that anytime we write a file, we are replicating all of these files synchronously or asynchronously. If we chose synchronously, that means that 100% we won't lose the file. If it shows asynchronously, there are situations that we might lose file because as soon as we write the file onto this file, even before it is replicated, okay, maybe it's, let's go slowly. So a write operation came in and the file is written over here, okay? And we responded back with 200, that return is successful. Even before we asynchronously replicate to this one and this one, what happens if this server goes down and the whole of, all of the data is uh, vanished? In that case, we will lose the file completely. So we can't achieve the 99.999 durability. So that's why in the case of writes, it's good to replicate synchronously and we won't uh, tell the client that we have created the file until unless we have successfully replicated to all of these regions. So these are the strategy. And now that you have the basic idea of how the system design came into existence, now let's understand in depth. So here is the system design for distributed data storage. So before understanding this system design diagram, it's better to understand some of the terminologies about data centers. So the first one is, what is, how does a cluster look like? So the cluster looks like um, this diagram in which you can see on the left side and the right side, these are the racks and in each rack, there are a lot of servers. A rack, it looks something like this and each of the rows in which you can see are different kind of servers. And you can pull in the servers and pull, uh, pull it, put it back uh, whenever you want. And the cables will connect into the backside of these servers. And each server in this rack looks something like this. They do doesn't look like the one which we use, uh, usually the desktops. And also, one thing you need to understand is in each of the servers, you can actually have redundant power supply and network for high availability. What does that mean is if power line one goes down, you still have always connected power line two, and this service uses the redundant, the other one, or the secondary power line to keep these servers up and running. And also the network, uh, and also the network lines as well. If the first network line goes down, and it uses the second network line to keep the connectivity between these servers with any of the um, other servers in the data centers or outside the data centers. And also you need to understand um, some terminologies about regions and availability zone. I'm sure you guys would have known from AWS that uh, for, for a easy understanding, think regions as different continents and availability zones as different data centers in the same continent uh, where all of these availability zones uh, data centers will not be put together in the same place. Instead, they will be put together in different places. So even if one data center goes down, you have another two data centers in the same continent. Um, so that's the basics. So let's understand the system design diagram. So except DNS and cluster manager, whatever you see below 
is the components in the clusters. And the same cluster will be there in other two regions. Suppose uh, we want to have a multiple replication, say three copies or three replication factor. In this case, we need to be running the same copy of clusters in other two different regions. So this representation is only for one region over here. So the first thing we need to understand is the cluster manager. This is the upper in the hierarchy, and this is the one which manages all the clusters. So here are the uh, important functionalities which it handles. The first one is allocates account. When the user creates a new account or a bucket in uh, the cloud service provider, what happens is the create account basically calls the cluster manager. Cluster manager creates a bucket and then we have to give a virtual hosting style host name or a you know, subdomain dot um, s3 dot location dot aws.com, something like that. So what, what it does is it creates that name, the bucket name dot whatever the actual domain name, and it updates the entry in the DNS with the IP of this load balancer over here. So what this load balancer is, is the entry point for all the requests to this um, distributed storage. Whatever API it is, it is you are uploading the file or reading the file or listing all the files in the bucket, whatever it is. So you will basically hit this load balancer to do that, perform the operation. So that subdomain should be mapped to uh, entry point, that's the load balancer. So the DNS, as soon as the DNS is updated, whenever we visit our bucket name dot S3 dot whatever, uh, host name, AWS console or whatever, it actually redirects to this cluster. So in here, the design is one specific region will be accepting the writes and that also has the capability to serve the reads and the other two regions will be um, having the data which is replicated from this cluster, which is write enabled clusters. And the other two um, uh, clusters can also be used for only reading purpose. So now how this works is, um, okay, how the cluster manager works is, uh, it actually allocates the account as I mentioned, and then uh, it actually does the recover, disaster recovery as well. What it does is if for some reason, if this system is down, it knows that we are already replicating two more copies in the other two clusters of similar setup. So it immediately changes the DNS name to instead of pointing to this load balancer to point you to the same cluster which is there in the other region. So all the requests will be keep on going to the other cluster and let this system recovers or fix whatever it has happened. Hypothetically, it shouldn't be the case like we should be fixing or if it, on worst case, if some power outage happened or storm or flood happened, so this whole data center is flooded, so we'll have to physically go and fix that. Until then, you'll, your system shouldn't be down or if the, uh, your, your service shouldn't be down, it should be high available. So the cluster manager itself is replicated also and it is distributed. So if you see anywhere, I have mentioned as an asterisk, uh, star mark. So what it means is it itself is replicated. I don't want to complicate writing multiple copies of it. So, so this itself is replicated and the data to the database is also replicated. So it never goes down. So it manages all of these clusters. So it redirects all the requests instead of this cluster to the other, and that will be considered as the right accepting cluster. So that's the overall idea. So the second one, the third one is the resource tracking. Um, this cluster manager also uh, keep on looking at what are the resources uh, which is there in this cluster and how much is it, it is consumed and also keeps track of how much um, data is utilized in the in the existing uh, complete storage available and uh, how much space is left and do we need to add more uh, servers to expand the data so it has to behave like elastic storage so it keeps computing uh, or keeps um, uh, showing the admins that we need to add more servers or whatever it is. So that also is the responsibility. And the fourth one is uh, it holds the policies, authentication rules, authorization rules, all of that. Because one of the important criteria in the distributed storage is we shouldn't, um, we should have a lot of authorizations policies, right? 
like admin should be able to do everything. Some of the users should only have access to a specific bucket or the folder, such kind of policies and all will be handled over here and saved in the databases. Okay, and the, and the fifth one is, it also manages the cluster. Um, as I mentioned, um, when the disaster uh, recovery supposed to be done or anything goes down or anything, this is the guy who takes the action. So before understanding the each and every individual components, it is better to understand the very high level working of the system. So how does this work? Suppose if a user has this file to be uploaded to this distributed storage and how does that work? So user has this file and he makes a call to the system based on the uh, subdomain dot AWS console dot com or whatever it is. So the DNS will resolve it to this load balancer. The request will land into this load balancer and this load balancer will has to pick one of the API server based on different strategy. It could be based on the load or based on round dropping or random, whatever it is. So the request will be landed into the API server. The file is here and API server should has a couple more responsibilities. So it is going to look for all the authorization policies and all the API um, ID, API key, which this user is using from this database and validates whether this operation is permitted for this key or for this user and based on um, the policies and authorizations, whatever it is. So it is going to all validate that if it is allowed to do that particular file upload, then it has to find the server which will process this request. So this design is um, based on the layering, okay? So this particular layer all written in green is called as partition layer and this particular um, layer here, which is written in purple color, is all streaming layer. So if you, if you look at this design, this is how Azure is built in. I had to read a lot of Azure related documents uh, and a lot of AWS related document to understand this one. So, so this is how it is actually designed. So this is partition layer, this is streaming layer. What happens is, so this guy, the API server, will look into the partition map table. What this table contains is, for any given file, which is the server, or which is the partition server, which should handle this particular request. And how does that find out? So this partition, um, how, how this partition works? When the file comes into the server, it will obviously has to assign a unique ID for that file. So it assigns, the API server assigns an UUID, which is always unique. So once you do hash of this unique UUID, you will get some number, okay? So you will have to find the server, which is which can handle based on the range partition. Suppose if the range for this partition server is assigned from zero to 100, say 100 to say 200, 200 to 300. So there'll be thousands of partitions server in any given cluster. So this partition map table actually contains the range and the part, the, the partition server's IP address or whatever it is, okay? So now once I have the UID, I get, I do hash off and then I get the number. And by the number, I look into the partition map table and I find out what is the partition server which will be handling this particular file upload. So I found out one among these so many partition servers and say, for example, I found out this is a partition server which actually uploads or take care of this file operation. So this API, API server will hand over that file into this partition server. And once this partition server receives this file, what it does is it talks to the streaming layer. The streaming layer is like one big file, which is actually built using a lot of small um, servers with disk heavy. Means uh, 115 server in here would have actually had about 20 to 30 terabytes of storage in it. So this whole layer looks like a distributed file system, okay? For these partition layer, they don't know where this uh, file servers are and it doesn't care anything about it. So it just talks to the stream so basically every partition server will have one stream assigned. Uh, stream is basically comprised of many um, file servers in which it is like, it is like a, uh, you can think of link list of file server, okay? And say there is a file server and this is also file server, this is also file server. Every file server has about 30 TB of space. Just let's consider that 30 TB of space, 30 TB of space. So they will be keep on adding from the head 
okay, as and when these are filled. So this would have already filled, this would have already filled, and this one, maybe out of 30 dB, it is still only 10 dB, uh, 10 TB is filled, and 20 TB is left. That means that this partition server can still use this file server to write another 20 TB of data. Once that is filled, a new empty server or empty file server will be added into the top of this, okay? So that also, that data will also be stored in this partition server, right? Uh, what is the file server you need to be updating? And these all, the combination of all of these um, file servers makes up a stream, okay? So always think like that. So this whole uh, group of file servers will be assigned to this partition servers. So always the top of the servers will have empty space and these are completely filled. So they are just there, okay? Now what happens is this partition server takes this file and writes into this file server and its job is done. Once it is written over here and the job of the streaming layer is to replicate on its own. So the partition server won't really care about it, okay? The partition server is to partition um, the writes into this streaming layer. What is the advantage of having partition servers is you can parallelize it and you can scale it. So if you are getting more and more requests, obviously uh, uh, you can always write one file here. You can't really make it parallel um, because hard disk will always will be writing one place. Or maybe if you have multiple hard disks, you can make that parallel as well. So, so the way to parallelize is you can have multiple partition server here. So you can have thousands of partition server and then you, you will assign a new range for all of that. Maybe you can use consistent hashing also, or you can use range-based uh, partitioning or whatever you want to. The idea is when a file comes in, based on some strategy, you can, so I am using, I'm using Yugu idea as a strategy to partition it. Maybe you can use account uh, uh, name itself. So if uh, maybe you can assign something like all the account name starts with this letter, Will be handled by this partition server something like that so we just need to distribute the incoming request to some of the partition servers based on some strategy i'm using rain based uh, partition and that mapping all stored in the partition map table right so this is the overall idea of how this works so now let's understand these layers in depth let's understand the streaming layer so this whole thing is a streaming layer right so what we get to the streaming layer is the file or chunk of the file. If the partition server thinks the file is too big, maybe it can chunk and send the uh, piece of the file itself. Okay, so what we get is the file or uh, think it like a blob of data. Okay, so this streaming layer responsibility is to get that file and store it into the hard disk and also do the replication. So I have listed out all the responsibilities of this layer. Okay. What, what is the first responsibility is append only. That means the file which you get it from the partition layer should be written into hard disk in appended only fashion. You shouldn't be updating in some place randomly. The reason why is the, the kind of hard disk we use in these file servers will be the spinning disk hard disk, which is not SSD because SSDs are too costly if you want to give the service in cost effective way, you will be using the cheapest hard disk available. That's the spinning disk hard disk. The spinning disk hard disk are high performant only if you keep the data appending to the file or to the hard disk. You shouldn't be doing the random writes. So always make sure that the data which you get from the partition layer is always appended to the hard disk, not the random writes. So that's the first responsibility. So as I already mentioned, each partition server will be having the streams. Think it like a list of servers uh, and the, always the first server will have some space left. The rest are completely locked or sealed because these servers are full, means the data is already completely stored in it. So we don't have space to write in here, okay? That's what the concept of sealing is. The sealing, um, the, the streaming, the streaming manager's responsibility is also, also is to seal the file servers. Suppose if this, as I mentioned earlier, if this file server is uh, has a space, total space of uh, total size of 30 TB and it is left with only 10 TB. Now, once the 10 TB of the file uh, data is written into this file server, now the space left in this file server is zero. 
The stream manager's responsibility is to keep on monitoring all of these active uh, writable file servers in this particular layer. Okay, it keeps on monitoring of the health. It also keeps on monitoring on the size of um, uh, the, the space which is left. So that way, as soon as it gets to know that this file server is uh, the space is empty, so it seals it off. Basically, in this database, it just marks this file server as totally full, and then it adds one more server on top of this streaming um, stream. So that way, if any other writes come files comes to this partition server, it will have a new file server where it can keep on writing with a new empty space in it. So and also that mapping will also be updated into the partition map table. So it knows what is the latest file server available in this particular stream. Uh, sorry, not here. Uh, it will be updated in the database of the stream manager. So every time when the partition server wants to write, it asks the streaming manager. So what is the latest disk where I can write this file in this particular stream? So think it like the streams also have the name of the same partition server. If the partition server is named as one, two, three, maybe the streams are also named as something like that. Okay, one, two, three. So in this stream, this is full. So the stream manager will add a new file, uh, file server. So it has empty space. So the partition server can keep writing uh, later. And also it, it keeps on writing in appended fashion only, okay? So how, how does the stream manager gets, what is the file server which is empty? So that's what the cluster manager comes into the picture. So the cluster manager will keep an eye on the resources available here. So we don't want to, uh, you know, have a lot of servers with empty space. So we always have to keep some buffer. Um, so suppose if I have 10 file servers over here, so it would add up to 30 GB, 30 TB uh, into 10. It's almost equal to 300 terabytes. We have to keep another 30% of uh, storage as buffer. Maybe we can add a 30 TB extra disk to the stream because we can't just keep purchasing a lot of file servers and keeping keep stacking into uh, in our data centers, right? It is not cost effective. So we'll, we replace order only when we keep on burning um, the empty space available because no, no customers will come and utilize everything. So 30% buffer is still good enough. So those empty servers will be, um, will be available to the stream manager or it knows where are those servers. It just swaps those IP addresses in the table so the writes will keep on going to those machines. So it's just that. So the next uh, responsibility of uh, the streaming manager is garbage collection. Suppose uh, if user wants to delete some file, then he makes an API call to delete that file. And obviously from the partition um, map table, we know which partition server is supposed to handle that request. And then it comes to one of the file server. And from the stream manager's database, we know that that specific file is present in which file in this particular, in which file server in this particular stream. So that way, we go to that particular file server and we are going to delete that specific file uh, which is there in that particular file server. So that way we deleted it. So there is empty space available. But do we need to tell the partition server later um, that, okay, there is empty space available somewhere and then keep writing there. So we shouldn't be because the first rule says that it is append only. That means that we shouldn't be doing the random writes into the hard disk. So if the space is empty, let it be. We're gonna recover it later. The process is called as garbage collection where the stream manager looks for all the you know sealed file servers where you're not allowed to write anymore and then see if how much it can uh, free up spaces in everywhere, okay? And then it tries to shuffle and move all the files into uh, the empty space and then make it free and update all the mappings in the table, right? So that way you can remove one server out of 10 or 15 servers, all empty spaces. So you will get one free server by moving all of the data to the empty spaces over here. So that empty server can be used uh, in the stream later when this the top of the file server is finished, you know, running out of the space. Okay, so that's how the garbage collection collection actually works. So the fourth thing is the streaming manager's responsibility is to take care of the uh, replication as well. So none of these layers responsibility is to replicate. It's the streaming layers responsibility where it is saving the data. So from the cluster manager, the streaming manager also knows what is the uh, the other regions 
file server which we can use it for the replication purpose. So anytime in the partition server writes some file into it, uh, this file uh, server, the streaming manager's responsibility is to take that file or chunk of the file and replicate into the other file server in the different region. Totally, we have to replicate it to two copy. So one in one region and maybe one more server in the other region. So that way, anything which is written into this file server, we always have two copies in other data centers. There are other two strategies as well, where, as I mentioned, uh, we can um, do synchronously or asynchronously. So how S3 does is, say S3 always guarantees that the first time when you create the file, it will be um, consistently available everywhere. And the second time when you update, it is um, uh, available as um, eventual consistency. So that way it means that the first time when you write it, it they make it synchronous replication and the later updates will all will be a synchronous way of updation okay so so one more strategy here is to do is you will have to replicate one copy internally in the same cluster in the same region itself and two copies to the outside the reason why we have to do that way is suppose if this guy is writing a file here so the first copy will be written into this file server even before replicating asynchronously to the other two regions. What if this server for some reason is dead immediately as soon as we write it? Write it and then we send the acknowledgement back that, okay, we have written that file into this file server. What if this file server is dead even before we replicate it asynchronously or synchronously to the other two servers? Uh, if we are replicating synchronously, it's good because we won't be sending back success status code until unless we are replicated to uh, the other regions. But what if, we, what if we are doing update, okay? And then we are doing asynchronous uh, replication. Even before we start the asynchronous replication, if this file is dead, then we basically you know, lose that particular update at all, uh, totally. So what we have to do is, we'll have to synchronously replicate in one of the you know, file server available over here, um, and then, so th that is that happens synchronously, and then until unless this copy is written here and in the uh, one more file server, maybe think like we have one more replicated replication server the, available in the same uh, file stream, and that's the responsibility is to only to keep a temporary replication uh, files. So what we have, what we'll do is the first time when the file is written here, we'll have to synchronously. Okay, the, even if it is update or first time writing, whatever it is, synchronously update into this file as well, and then say that, okay, we have finished the update, and then you slowly replicate this file asynchronously. That way the writes are also faster. And even if this server goes down, we still have one more copy over here, so we are safe. Okay, so this is the strategy we can follow. So the next uh, responsibility is health check of the file system. As I already mentioned, uh, the stream manager will keep on checking the health um, uh, status of all of this file server. If it finds uh, one of the file server is not really healthy, so it, you might take a decision of decommissioning that and copying the data over somewhere. Or if it finds that some of the server, which is already sealed off because it was full, is having some problem, is corrupted or something, then you can just remove this file, add a new file server here, and copy all the replicated data from other region because it knows where I have repl replicated the data to. You can copy it back and then fill it and then keep it over here. So the way it knows is streaming manager will have two different tables over here. So the first table is which contains information like the stream ID and the primary server responsible, the replication uh, one, the copy first replication copy and the second replication copy server name. So where this data is used is when the partition server wants to write to the stream, you, so it knows what stream I'm writing it to, but it doesn't know what is the file server I should be writing because these servers might be keep on adding newly. So it asks the stream layer before it starts writing. So from the table, it knows that, okay, for the stream ID, say for example, two, so the primary server is this one. So if this ID is say 11, 11 is the primary server, so the replicated servers are some different name, maybe in the region two, so R212, R213, maybe, so, or maybe uh, this is replicated to region three, R212, R313. So the, the copy of this same data is present in 
R212 server in the region 2, R313 server in region 3. So this is the mapping it will also hold. So the partition server, whenever it wants to write, it basically checks uh, in this table, uh, basically asks stream manager, and stream manager gets this information from the table and gives it back to partition server. Partition server knows what is the file where I should be writing, uh, and it goes right to that file server. So here I have written like a linked list just for your representation, but ideally this file server, file servers will be somewhere distributed, right? You just need to know what is the IP to which I need to keep on writing the data. So that's where you get the information from this table. So the other table is, um, the one more concept you need to understand is uh, block group. And why do we need block group? So if you know from the operating system uh, basics, uh, all the data which is written into the disk is written as blocks, right? So the blocks are the group of sectors. So in the, in the, in the disk, so if the spinning disk is like this, the sectors are something like this, right? So these are the set sectors, okay? So, and the blocks are group of these sectors. And why do we need uh, a block with multiple sectors in it? In it is because um, we only have a limited set of addresses in any operating system. So to accommodate more and more memory, we use blocking uh, blocks and uh, a block is group of many uh, sectors and each block gets an individual address. So, so we always know the fix, the block will be always having a fixed size of length. So in this case as well, we can define our fixed size of length. Say, for example, if you have defined it as, say, one MB or something, okay? So our block size is one MB, and we will also create a abstraction of these blocks called as block group. And the reason why we need block group is I'm gonna explain it now. Suppose, think like we don't have a block row. So we have so many files writing, uh, written by the user. They are all of the size, maybe just one MB, one MB, one MB, okay? So now our server has about 30 TB of space. He is writing about, you know, thousands of one MB files. Now it will be diffi very difficult for the stream manager to keep on replicating all of these files. So instead of that, the very better way to do that is you create an abstraction a layer on top of these blocks, okay? Say suppose a block rope size of about, say, 10 MB, okay? So its job, the stream manager's job will be to always replicate the whole block itself. If we lose that block or if the file servers are crashed, it, its responsibility is to bring that block back from wherever it was uh, replicated. So it's, it's, it's like an abstraction of, uh, abstraction of over blocks, a group of blocks. So a 10 MB block group can contain multiple files or a chunk of a file, it's up to us. Think of S3, the use case, uh, a lot many times when we say, uh, you know, images, they, they, these images will be 100 KBs or even lesser or 1 MB or something like that. So the block group, I'm just mentioning it as 100 MB, it could be even higher. So it will be easier for replication and bringing it back and all of the stuff. So, so that's the idea of uh, block group. The whole blocks itself are replicated to the other servers. And when the blocks are missing, you will bring back the blocks. Um, and the blocks for the streaming layer looks like a big file. And the other advantage is since we are appending all the data in append only fashion. So in this table, we'll be writing all the, you know, offset of the file in this block. Say for example, the file uh, with one MB, maybe starting from this block and ending it this. So we are going to save uh, the offset of that file with the file name here, the file ID, maybe it's the UID or whatever it is, and the uh, start offset zero and the end offset maybe two. And uh, what is the primary server which is holding this information is maybe this one, 11. And what is the replication one and replication to all of this information you can store it here. So this way we know exactly in, in this particular block group, where the file is starting and where the file's data is ending. So we know that, okay, this part is the file, uh, which we are uh, storing it here. So if you look at, since, since we will be getting huge traffic, this block will be filled in a couple of seconds. So instead of just replicating a bits and pieces of one one file, we can just replicate the whole block group across 
uh, different replication servers. So you can go with without having block group as well. The only complication is, in that case, you will you will be replicating the files itself. Okay, uh, nothing much. It's just an abstraction of group of files. Or it could be if if the file is bigger, it could be broken into chunks. So the chunks of the files will be replicated somewhere, and then you'll have you'll have to bring back all the chunks. For this layer, it doesn't really matter. It's a file or anything. It just thinks everything as a blob. Okay. If you just if you don't want to use block group, as I said, you just have to replicate those files and then bring back those files when the data is missing. And the next thing we need to understand is about the partition layer, specifically partition manager. We know that the functionality of the partition servers already. So if you look at there is a zookeeper or you can use any lock manager or coordination manager. The reason for having that is as I already mentioned that there could be that one or more servers of this or service of the stream manager could be running, we have to make sure that there is only one service manager per cluster is always up and running because we don't want two service managers to be managing all of these streams. So you can use Zookeeper to decide who is the master. And also similarly, partition manager as well, we always need only one specific partition manager to be up and running for this, uh, you know, for the reliability purpose, we need to have one more. So that also can be uh, handled by using Zookeeper. Um, specifically, you can use sequential Znode to identify who is the uh, primary partition manager or stream manager. And um, the primary responsibility of the partition manager is to assign partition server to a specific range of uh, you know partition IDs. So, and also uh, using Zookeeper, partition manager always makes sure that there is only one server which is handling a range of uh, you know the partition IDs um, because it will be uh, problematic if one or more server partition servers are assigned for the same range um, it will become difficult um, and the other important things partition manager will make sure is say for example if more and more files are written for some reason if more traffic is coming to one specific partition in that case this is heavily loaded the APIs will be uh, slowed down or the latency will increase or we can't really meet SLS. So what uh, partition manager will do is, partition manager's responsibility is also to keep on checking the load or health of these partition server. If some partition servers goes down, it immediately assigns one more partition servers and updates the partition map table. So the API server, when it looks back, it knows what is the, pop, uh, the current active partition server. And also, uh, when, when the partition manager keeps on tracking the load and health of these partition server, when it figures out that one of the partition server is heavily loaded because more writes are coming through, for some reason, all of them are falling into this specific range of zero to 100. Um, so usually we have to choose a partitioner uh, in a way that it should be equally distributed. It might happen that there could be sometimes hotspots. So partition manager should be splitting this partition into two. Instead of assigning zero to 100, what it will do is it will create two ranges, one for zero to 50 and maybe 50 to 100. So instead of having one range from zero to 100, now we have two partitions. A new partition server will be assigned for zero to 50 and a new stream will be created. So that way the load now is balanced into two partitions. So that way we can handle uh, the, the same amount of traffic in very less time so we can still um, uh, meet the SLS. So, and also part of that is the partition manager will request stream manager to create a new stream. So a new file server will be added and the all the tables will be updated accordingly. Okay, so now one more interesting thing you need to understand is suppose uh, there are cases where um, uh, users will be accessing the same file multiple times. Is it worth it to always go through all of this cycle and then read the data from here? So there, there is a caching layer as well in the API server. If there is a request coming for the same file multiple times, usually these uh, files are also cached in the cache layer. So when the next request, request comes in, uh, the API server will actually read that data from the cache itself and serve it back instead of touching any of these things. And there is one more concept called as one hit wonders. Um, so it's specifically one hit wonders. So it means that instead of caching the file access the very first time, 
we shouldn't be doing that. In, it's not just in this use case, anywhere when you're actually caching, uh, it's always not a good idea to cache it on the first API call itself um, because a lot of times these kind of calls could be just only one call in a day. If you sense these kind of situations, then it's not to do. So instead you can have a counter if the request is more than specific uh, threshold, say maybe if the request to that specific file is more than five times, um, then only you cache it. So that way you don't really waste the cache uh, uh, storage as well. Uh, and you definitely make cache, uh, you definitely cache the files one uh, for the ones who has more access rate. So that's one more strategy you can consider over here. Um, the other thing you need to understand is how the partition manager um, data will data and also stream manager data will be replicated to the other uh, cluster we have referred. Um, the, to the other cluster, uh, the cluster manager has um, uh, referred it as the replicated uh, replication cluster. Um, so everything which we save in here will also be replicated back to that at the other cluster. So the same information is available in those clusters as well for read operations. Um, so if, for example, if this something happens to this cluster and this is no, no more functional, then the cluster manager will immediately change the DNS name uh, to the other cluster. So all the writes will be handled by the other clusters. Um, if everything is still fine, we can always um, uh, point to all the reads to the other um, uh, you know, clusters as well, if you can configure that way, all the writes go into this cluster and if there is a read request, you can configure to serve from the other place as well. The only thing you need to understand is, uh, since we are going through the, in, you know, eventual consistency model, uh, even though if the write happens here, by the time it replicates, if there are reads happening on the other cluster, it might read the old data. So that's uh, actually, that's, that's how the S3 also works. Um, it is still fine. If, if the users are fine, we can enable that. So uh, otherwise we can always uh, use this cluster itself as a read and write, and we can switch over to the other cluster only when something happens to this cluster. Mm, I guess I have uh, covered all of the important cases, which you guys should know. Yeah, so if you, if you guys like this video, please hit a like, share, subscribe. Um, thanks a lot. And if you want to buy me a cup of coffee or a dinner, you can always join to this channel. Um, it just costs you a dollar a month. Thank you.